Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Day Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Modern Day James. That's my new title. Uh, this episode was brought to you by Skillshare. You can use my link, skl.sh slash modern day James, to get two free months when you sign up. It was also brought to you by Amazon, and or excuse me, Audible. You can use my <laughs> website, use my link, audibletrial.com slash modern day James, to get a 30 day free trial. It's a really great service if you like listening to books and you're illiterate like me and you can't read words. Um, also brought to you by my Gumroad. You can buy my premium tutorials at gumroad.com slash modern day James if you want to improve your art and drawing. And uh, Marco, I don't know if you have any Gumroad tutorials, but if you do, people should check it out. Uh, but I do know you're on Skillshare as I've been promoting it a bunch. And uh, it's also brought to you by the lifeblood of the channel, my patrons who subscribe on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. If you want to get some, uh, uh, the, the uh, excuse me, the, if you want to get the archive of live streams, you can head over there. If you want to get access to my Gumroad tutorials at a discounted price, you can do that. And um, yeah, and I just realized that I'm actually streaming on my main channel and not streaming on, <laughs> on the that, podcast. That's why I can't. <laughs> uh, it's a, a day of technical difficulties. Let me head over there really fast. Oh, Lord. Sorry, Marco. Allow me to introduce my guest, the epic and awesome Marco Bucci. Thanks so much for coming. Hey, Mr. Modern Day, James. How's it going? <laughs> it's you know, going modern, good. For a modern guy, you sure don't know how to use a, a, a computer very well. No, not at all. I really don't. Oh, my God. I, I have too many channels. I have three at this point, so I'm just... I'm all over no, the place. Three. I do have three. I have a music one. I have this one. But there's more people going to watch now anyway since we're on the main channel. So Nice. So how are you doing? Well, hey, every, every everyone watching. Uh, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for coming by. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm back in New York. I'm really happy about that. You moved? Yeah. Well, I, I moved to L.A. for... Um, for brainstorm and then i moved back and i'm just doing an online mentorship through brainstorm now so i'm back oh, home nice nice good stuff i love new york where, where are you in new york i'm in brooklyn the best borough oh man next time yeah. i'm out there i'll let you know please and, please uh, have a beer yeah for sure for sure where are you i know you just went on vacation uh i was a uh, vacation was bahamas i live in canada near near toronto awesome yeah. Last time we spoke, though, I lived in Germany. My wife had a job out there, like a three-year contract. So I just came back a oh. few months ago from three years in Germany. Okay, so you're in Toronto now. Yeah, nearby anyway. Yeah. Okay, because my, my friends and I are all planning to leave America and we're going to emigrate to Canada. So when we yeah. do so, we'll move by and uh, we'll play some hockey or something. Yeah, sure. Let me know <laughs> when that happens. Yeah, yeah well, hopefully soon. Um yeah, so I hope you didn't mind that I keep plugging you on all my Skillshare advertisements. Man, thanks. So that, that's humbling. Uh, thanks. And I should say, like, I told you this uh, in our chat, but uh, that cool that, that little skit you did was awesome. Thank you. There's a whole backstory there, um, and I'll tell you about it at another point in time because it's sure. in depth. It's a little bit crazy, uh, and I'm just gonna. It's just gonna be ever growing. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I want to uh, delve into your history because. I, like you said before the chat, we've been we talked a really long time ago, so I'm sure there's some stuff that some stones that were left unturned. So typically in the podcast, I like to find out why people started or how they got into art, and then sort of how you got on your path to where you are now. So take me back to really early on, back a baby Marco Bucci. How did you get uh, started? Well, well, baby Marco Bucci never drew anything. I never. I was always interested in creating stuff, but I guess like you, music music was my first artistic outlet. Okay. Uh, so I learned, like my parents had me in piano lessons when I was very young, and I actually took music. I don't really, I mean, I play casually now, but I took that pretty far, like academically. I, I graduated okay. like uh, conservatory, like grade eight piano. I kind oh, of wow. made my way up. And then it was in high school that I started becoming interested in in art and what did it for me was two two things toy story in 1995 and uh a game called riven the sequel to oh, Mist. remember yeah, that one yeah um, riven is still one of my all-time favorite things that's ever been created and uh those two things got me thinking about art but i i, I couldn't draw like i wasn't i didn't have a natural sort of uh gift for drawing so i i just assumed that i wasn't meant to draw so i thought hey uh well Toy Story and Riven are both CG, 
so I got into like computer graphics yeah. when I was like 16 years old, uh, roughly. And um, I started with um, like True Space. There's a program called True Space. There's a program called Pavre, where you actually coded your images with like code. <laughs> Whoa. Like, okay. Yeah, it was crazy. Like I'd be sitting there and be like, sphere, X equals 30, Y equals 20. And like it would put a sphere at this level, right? That's a very insane. artistic approach to it. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it was insane. I, I can't even believe I did that, but that's there. There I was, and then I got into like, uh, I acquired industry standard software like Softimage. This is back in 1997, and uh, I started learning that. And then uh, keep just keeping going with the story. I went to film school because I wanted to be an animator. Uh, I sorry, I got into 3D, but I, I really loved drawing. But yeah, I couldn't draw but I wanted to draw. So I tried okay. to get into animation school at Sheridan, which is a very popular school yep, here I've in, heard uh, about it. in Canada. Yeah, but I couldn't get in because I couldn't pass the portfolio requirements. Oh, so man. I got rejected from Sheridan and my, my option number two was film school, which I got accepted to because of my computer graphics work. So oh, okay. The, yeah, so film school, was, uh, I went to a place called Ryerson University in Toronto. Uh, they accepted my portfolio of 3D work so I got into film school. So I studied like uh, writing and, and, you know, cinematography and editing and, you know, all that stuff that goes into filmmaking. Um, and, and then from there, I was able to pursue drawing on my own. So I found a little life drawing studio down the street from my school. They had like live drawing from the model like five days a week. So I would go like three to five days a week constantly. And that's when I started learning how to draw. And then I guess okay. you can fast forward that to where I am now. Like that that's where it all started. Well, well there's before you fast forward to where you went where you are oh, now, sorry. there's definitely a lot of in between steps I wanna know yeah, about. Yeah. You know, how oh, did you okay. like first of all, developing drawing or anything like that is obviously incredibly difficult and a really uh, a, a huge process. But how did you go yeah. about um, you know, when you were doing your, your studies, but how did you go about transitioning that to a career in art? You know, what was your first gig or how did you acquire that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my first drawing teacher, actually the only drawing teacher I've ever had, like the guy I could call a teacher, he ran his own studio. Like he started his own business. This is back in 2001. Okay. And he taught. So his own business was he taught classes like he was. His name is Nick Kalislian. I mentioned him last time we spoke, but Nick Kalislian, who still works in animation, you guys can Google him. He's got a website and he's, he's great. He does a lot of like comic book stuff and animation design. He taught me uh, figure drawing. And so he, he was paying the bills by teaching students, and I was one of his students. And um, he also was doing freelance work from this little studio space he had rented out in Toronto. So my first gig was, I studied with Nick for like three years. I, would, I took all his classes, and like I would just be there. And, and uh, I was dedicated to it, so yeah. Nick brought me on as like a TA. So when Nick had a, like a noob student like I once was, I would teach that student, like we would start like with gesture drawing and building form and boxes and cylinders and stuff. Okay. Like I was that teacher for that student. And then it was like, a, it's like martial arts. Like you learn from like the white belt yeah. and then you don't learn from the black belt right away. Okay, okay. Lower tiers. So Nick would jump in like later, like Nick would come in later. So that's kind of how he taught. It was really cool. So I got my first experience teaching there and then uh, my art was progressing. So Nick kind of brought me on as a, an intern Okay. Uh, um, an intern, he, he couldn't pay me, but he I got paid an experience, which back then was great because I was still a student, right? So I wasn't looking for any pro job yet. So, you know, Nick would get a job, uh, like a freelance illustration job, and I would kind of shadow him. And if there was anything I could do, like with my skills, which were limited at the time, but, you know, I could like do a lot of like fill, like if he needed shapes being filled in Photoshop, like I could do that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I was kind of like riding his on his back for a while. And then that was, I guess, my first professional gig or my first taste of it. I was, wasn't getting paid at the time. But then my first pay gig came right after that in 2005. There was a, um, a job fair at a place called Core Digital Pictures. They're gone now. But uh, they did some work for Disney and some stuff, Nickelodeon. Okay, uh, cool. They hired me to be a background painter on a Nickelodeon show. So that was my first job in 2005. Awesome. Wait, now how did you... I have a few questions, but how did you, yeah. how did you get land that first gig with the, with Nickelodeon? How did you transit? Cause a lot of the listeners are people that are searching for jobs or maybe they don't feel like they're qualified. How did you make that transition there? Okay. So, you know, back in 2005, which sounds like it's not a long time ago, but that's like 14 years ago, yeah. um, which is crazy. Like back it's, then we still, people still carried around portfolios. Yeah. So there was uh, so core digital pictures was a big studio. 
and they had a job fair like they were just it was like a cattle call for artists and uh, I'm like, well, there's nothing to lose. Let's go to this thing. Let's go to this event. It was at like a local tavern somewhere. They just rented it out. <laughs> and uh, cool. yeah, have a drink and, you know, let's let's meet some people. Now, and I had my portfolio. Now, my portfolio wasn't very good, but it did have, like, it was scattered. The, the work was of variable quality. But I think the best quality work I had in my portfolio, and this is thanks to Nick, was I, I had some drawings that are some paintings that I had painted of Nick's drawings. Now, I made sure I credited him in the portfolio, like Nick okay. the drawing, I, I did the painting. And then I also had some of my own paintings, like my own background paintings, my own plein air paintings. And that part of my portfolio caught the attention of one of the art directors there. And he's like, oh, you like painting? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, we're, we need painters. And awesome. I guess he noticed that my painting was of a higher level than my design, okay. uh, which which I think it still is. And um, he, I got hired for background art. Awesome. Now... Uh, actually, somebody's asking, what uh, shows did you do your background painting for? Uh, that show at the time, that show was called Iggy Arbuckle. And you know what? Okay. It, there's actually some samples on my website. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure if it actually was Nickelodeon. I could be wrong about that. I, I trust. I'm going to say it's Nickelodeon anyway. Nobody's, sure. Nobody is fact-checking here. Don't worry yeah, about yeah, that. It might have been some other studio. I can't remember. Do some you, Canadian division <laughs> of some studio. Do you do this thing? Now, I, I'm a, a big video game nerd. I always kind of break down my my abilities in art into almost like these skill levels where i you know it's like an <laughs> rpg like i have x amount of vitality x amount of endurance and for me it's like oh i have x amount of perspective x amount of color and light and painting yeah, yeah. do you find yourself doing that sort of thing i definitely assess my skills in what i think is an honest way i don't use your nerdy video game oh analogies. well you don't have to insult <laughs> me you don't have to Dude, the, the last video game I ever played was Quake 3. So oh, wow. Yeah, like I haven't touched a console since Quake 3. Oh, man. Uh, that was my last thing. And then before, even before, I was never much of a gamer, to be honest. I think they're really cool. I just, for some reason, I don't play video games. I don't know what it is. You're missing out uh, on, a, on a great uh, realm. Was it? You know what? Oh, yeah. sorry. Go, no, no, no you, you go on. I loved watching people play uh, Team Fortress. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, people still but, love that today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I. I haven't played since Quake 3, but anyway. Oh, man. But, yeah. So for you, was it always, you were always headed towards TV and film? Yeah, I because I wanted to, uh, when I, I mentioned earlier, I wanted to be an animator or like something in the 3D realm of visual effects yeah. or animation. So that was film, right? Yeah. Uh, th these days, there's many more outlets for it. and uh, But back then, it was film. So going into TV was a natural choice for me being in Canada, in Toronto, because there's a ton of TV stuff in Toronto, uh, and there still is. So awesome. that's where I went. Like, you know, in California, obviously, there's more film stuff. I imagined if I lived in California, I might have gone into the film industry, but in Canada, it was more TV. And since then, I've, I've connected with some film stuff, but yeah. That's really cool. Now, I don't want to get, I don't always want to delve too deep into people's styles, but your artistic style is amazing, and I always have to, you know, I want to delve a little bit deeper into it. How did you start to develop your style as a painter? What do you, what sort of, was it a conscious decision? Was it something that was unconscious? Uh -oh. Um, oh, there you so, go. No, it, it was totally unconscious. And the way, basically, I mean, if I can recount a story that I think is important with that, I, if you look at my paintings now, mm -hmm. there is an element of, uh, messiness to them yeah but what I try and do is I try and bring I've mentioned this in one of my videos I try and bring like order to the chaos that's if I had to define what I do it that's yeah. what I do I have a chaotic mess and I try and dig myself out of that hole and bring order to it and I try and bring order in just the right amount of levels in just the right amount of places so everything is not equally ordered uh, you know I might have like the focal point being the most orderly and then it progresses down so by the time you're in the background it's like just utter chaos but it works it hopefully works yeah um, that's what I try and do and I don't always succeed but that's what I try and do but the way I develop that like that's really linked to what I've always tried to do like it's just in my personality so I remember back in my first year of film school I took a composition class and um, we had the, the project was we had to cut out with scissors we had to cut out uh, construction paper black and white construction paper in squares like you have to cut them out in squares or yep. rectangles and paste those in a frame and you had to make a, an abstract composition with these cut out uh, cards that you pasted. And I 
did not take a lot of pride in my craftsmanship. Like I would cut out like they were barely squares, man. They were like whatever, <laughs> like weird things. Yeah. And I I got a, an F. Oh and, no. Uh, I'm like, man, why did I get an F? I went to the teacher. I'm like, why did I fail this? And he's like, because you took no pride in your craftsmanship. Like you you just tried to like vomit something out. Yeah. And so I feel like that's always been in me. This whole vomiting thing but, but <laughs> it's and, a little bit of an acid reflux but <laughs> yeah yeah but the the thing that i've developed over the years like since like 2001 is the skill to control it so you know if you watch me paint i still like just spew things out and a lot of my students get frustrated like what are you doing here and i'm like yeah i don't know it's just what i do <laughs> and like my classes are not that esoteric I, I when i teach my classes i don't do that yeah because i know it's not helpful but when I paint, I, I don't know, I just do stuff. And then I try and use my skills with uh, values and drawing and shapes and all the things I teach on my YouTube channel. Yeah. I try and use all that to bring order to it. And then for me, that's a very pleasing aesthetic, which is why I go for it. But to answer your question, uh, to come full circle, it's always been part of me, the whole, like how I paint has always been inside me. And it's the same way I play music. You know, I, I try and play in a way that's a little more feel based rather than technical. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's so interesting how um, one how those, especially with music and art, how your personality or the way that you approach it comes out in both. Because I feel like I play music the same exact way that I draw. It's very yeah. it's very similar, but it's also funny because watching your videos, it's very coherent, it's very put together, and it, it it's very it seems almost different than the way you go about um, the way you go about painting. Like it's it's your videos feel so coherent and. Uh, not messy at all, I guess I would say. Right. Yeah. Well, I think what I've done is a, what I've tried, what I try and do as a teacher, and this is just how I've learned art, mm -hmm. because I have the inclination to be messy and like very unrefined, I had to learn very specifically, like, what are the things that I have to do to make this look like a good painting? And yeah. it all boils down to the fundamentals, like controlling shapes, controlling value, understanding light and shadow and color. So I, I've developed those skills and i still try and hone them here like today but i've developed like methods by which to understand those and and i plug that in so when i do a youtube video i i know like okay here is how to control shapes i have like all these theories in my head they're just my i've picked i mean some of them i've learned totally from other artists some of them are my own ideas and i mix them all together yeah but, like my videos seem structured because i i actively put away all that esoteric stuff that I do and I just focus on what are the things that you absolutely need to do to control value yeah and then you can you can apply that to any style now do you find uh, maybe it's because I'm earlier along in this art process but do you find that when you make videos and you kind of put a name to every step that you're doing that it helps you really refine the process or do you think that yeah. okay because yeah I, I'm finding that as well like and I've always found this if you can describe exactly what it is you're doing and what you're doing at each step you kind of cut out those middle steps or maybe something that's redundant. I don't know if you find that in your, your art as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm always trying to trim that, uh, the fat away. So I'm, if I have a problem, I can troubleshoot it very clearly. Um, and, and I give weird names to things too. Like the students who have studied with me at CGMA, they'll know things like, uh, I call the, well, it's weird, but I call light the bully. I won't explain why, but I call light the bully. <laughs> Wait, I no, call... you have to explain why. <laughs> Oh, well, it's just because the way the color of the light um, is a huge, it has a huge impact on the, the colors of the scene, like uh, the colors that the, the light hits will determine the color of the object uh, to a large degree. So it's like a schoolyard bully who beats everyone up. And that's what the color does. It's like the color is the bully and, and forces everyone to be in its command. Whereas, um, the, you know, the shadows are free of the bully because they're not hit by the direct light. So all these things I get into my lessons, I try and be very visual with it and i totally come up with like weird names and weird analogies <laughs> and some of them don't work uh, yeah and then some of them do and they stick i love that i love that um how how much of part of i guess maybe your your day-to-day -day is teaching versus studio work or anything like that you, you know it, because i'm a freelancer it really varies so okay. teaching is consistent in my schedule and it's become actually a more prevalent part of my schedule so i do one youtube video a month and I teach at CGMA and I do private mentorships from my Patreon. So okay. those three things may give me a consistent uh, pipeline of teaching. So I'm always working on one of those things or probably all three at the same time. Uh, so that keeps me busy day to day. And then 
I'm also a freelancer. So whenever, and you know, freelancing is variable, right? So whenever a job comes in, I'm like really busy because I have to do both. And yeah. if, if I'm not, yeah, if I'm not working on a job, I'm able to just focus on my teaching stuff. So uh, these days I'm actually pretty busy because I'm working on uh, a couple different freelance jobs plus my regular teaching. So my schedule really fluctuates. Okay. So you feel like you have three full-time jobs all at once and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Sometimes it can be a bit of a nightmare, but uh, yeah. Well, how about you? You're doing a lot of teaching. Like, where do you where do you teach officially? I'm teaching officially through Brainstorm. I teach uh, okay. I teach through Patreon. Um, yeah. And I and Brainstorm Patreon and I guess on YouTube as well. You can consider that teaching. Um, and yeah, it, it becomes a balance. And, and sometimes I'm just like, you know, you have so many different avenues and different directions pulling you. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to end up limiting that a little bit because I, I, I feel like sometimes if you're spending so much time teaching, it can take away from doing projects and maybe because yeah. I personally don't work on projects as much. Uh, I would like to get more in that direction. Yeah. Um, like I said, like, you, like, uh, sorry, like personal projects or like studio projects or both? either, either. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I personally enjoy being self-employed, so probably more personal projects than anything. Uh, Me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a double-edged sword because it's it's nice that you can control your own schedule, control everything, uh, but it's not nice in that it doesn't turn off at the end of the day. Yeah, I know. I've struggled with that over the years. I'm getting better at it. Do you have like a shut off time? Like I know it's impossible to just shut it off. But... No, I don't have a shut off time. That's yeah. why that's when that's when the video games come in because it, it gets uh, to like one in the morning and I'm still thinking about it. And then I'm like, whoop. Yeah, for me, what's what's funny for me is so uh, I, I'm married and my wife doesn't I mean, this is thanks to her. She doesn't tolerate that. Like I can't work till midnight every night. She'll, yeah. she'll leave. Right. Yeah. So I, I have learned, uh, and I think this is a good thing. I have learned to have a shut off time. So I have like a regular work day. I work from like 8am till five or six or something like that. Yeah. Uh, depending on the work and, um, that's it. And like every now and then, like if I have a crazy deadline, I'll, I'll work late and that's fine. But, um, my wife travels a lot for work. Like she'll have to fly to the States or something. Um, when she's gone, I'm up till 3 a.m. <laughs> click, clicking away on the computer and I'm right back to bachelor mode. Like that's in me still. I will work till 3 in the morning. Yeah, I'm right back to it. I can, I can relate really hard to that. I, I completely understand. Yeah, it's just like something happens where your brain's just like, well, I could just do another hour. I could just keep going. Yeah, like, I mean, I don't know. What do you think it is? Like, is it a compulsion to solve problems? Because that's what art kind of is. That like, what do you think it is? It's a, I always think it's a bit of that. It's a bit of obsession. It's a bit of self-loathing. It's all that, all that mixed <laughs> into one thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's all that mixed into one. Because you're always going to, at least for me, I'm just like, I, I see somebody and I'm like, oh, but I can't do that yet. <laughs> and then, and yeah. then I have to work towards that. Oh, totally. Like for me now, it's uh, it's actually funny because I mentioned I started this whole thing, my art with uh, 3D stuff. Yeah, I've been in the last year. I've been getting back into that. Oh man, so I've been um, I've been doing like tons of like you can't see it, but in the background now I have Blender open and I'm like, modeling stuff for a new <laughs> video, like a new YouTube video. I'm awesome. trying to put visual effects in my videos more now to get me like learning new skills. It's been fun, but man, it's such a time suck. Like I go it to is. bed and I'm thinking about tracking markers and 3d and you know how to i don't know apply a uv map to this object yeah. in the best way and i found with art too especially there's like more so than music for me at least i i've i found with art that there's so many different avenues that you can go that you start going down these sort of rabbit holes and you're like wait a minute this isn't contributing to the the greater picture of what i need to do <laughs> like for me i keep having this battle of doing 2d animation versus just pure illustration and yeah. i'm like oh, how much time am i going to devote to one how much time am i going to devote, devote to the other and the they keep just pulling each other in opposite directions i'm i i'm there every day man yeah i don't think it yeah i'm glad to hear it doesn't well not entirely glad to hear it doesn't end but i think a lot of people will be glad to hear that because they go through the same things and they don't know exactly where to put their time or, or put their focus yeah like I don't know. Like at the root of it, I just think like art is the coolest thing. Like, and I love so many art forms. I love two D animation. Yeah. I love three D modeling. I lo obviously love painting. That's like my main, obviously my main thing. Mm -hmm. And I love, I, I love so many forms of art. And I'm like, how, 
you know, how can you actually manage that and still <laughs> maintain a life that is not completely insane? Yeah, like I don't want to. I mean, this is just me, but I don't want to do art twenty four seven because I'll get burned out. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't. I, you know, I'll, I'll do art every day usually, or at least five days a week because it's my job. But like, I want to manage a life too. I like doing other things. It's it's difficult. It's frustrating. Like it's you almost never can like turn it, it off. It is almost like an addiction. Sometimes I think about it because. I love doing other stuff. I go, I've been going rock climbing and that's been a, a huge, oh, nice. uh, I, I like the idea of having a hobby that's physical. So that way it can, yeah. sort of counteracts the sitting here all day. And, yep. um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like an addiction. You're just like, uh, eh, well, I'll just go another day or, or it, you can always just kind of postpone. Oh yeah. No, I definitely think it's closer to an addiction than it is to a love. <laughs> it's, it's closer to addiction. <laughs> that's really funny. Um, Oh, I have a question. So you started in film school and going down this sort of rabbit hole of pulling ourselves in different directions and doing different things. Have you ever delved into film at all? Have you ever tried to, to direct anything like that? I've made uh, short films in okay. the past. Uh, like well, I, had to, I had to make one for my thesis project to graduate film school. So that was, so I made an animated film. Um, and that got me like, actually the background paintings from that film helped me get hired. Uh, I didn't mention that in my earlier story. So, See, you skip you uh, skipped the details that we needed to know. <laughs> though you're digging them up now. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So background paintings from that film. It's so, like I, I I did everything. I did the backgrounds. I did the animation, and it was a classic student film. I bit off way more than I could chew, but I learned <laughs> a ton. Like the film wasn't good, but I learned so much. Yeah. Um, and then I made another animated film uh, a year after that. And then I made another animated film a year, a few years after that. So I've made my own films. Um, and one thing I like to do with my YouTube channel these days is I try and make them filmic. Like the, yeah. I, I, yeah, I try and add like an entertainment value to them. That's beyond simply the art lesson. I try and make them little short films, Definitely. like a, my, my 10 minutes to better painting series. Uh, like I, I script those out. Like I have a, you know, a little notebook here and like, you know, i you can't see it, but this is like the script for an episode. And it's some, there's thumbnails in it, there's writing in it. And like, I feel like this is a little movie script. Definitely. And, um, yeah. So I, I totally use my love for film in, on my YouTube channel. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I always find, cause I'm, again, I do those silly little skits and I'm like, I, I think to myself, I'm like, what if I did an actual thing? And then my brain goes yeah. down that rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep. Yep. And then 4am comes along. You're like, what, what happened? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I've noticed in your painting, or at least what you have on the YouTube, I haven't seen too much 3D in that. So are you going to start incorporating that into your digital painting? Yeah, I actually have been doing that for clients. Okay. Um, when I when I paint for myself, I don't want to do that because I want to keep everything. You know, I want to do my own. I want to search for my own solutions. Yeah. But when it comes to 3D, a lot of turnaround time. Like I'm working on a concept art job uh, on a film right now, actually, and they want it, it's a pretty hectic turnaround. Yeah. And like I'm, I dealt back into, that's why I'm learning. I learned or some basic modeling in blender so I could just get in there. Like I had to model a, uh, I had to paint some scenes inside of a, like an old uh, shed or like barn. Okay. And instead of mapping out perspective in 2d, which I could do, I have those skills, but I just modeled it in blender and then I can move, move the camera around, change the lens type and change all this stuff Yeah. and render out. Yeah. You know, render out a basic, wireframe scene and then i'll use that as my perspective lay in and then i'll just draw the crap out of that i don't use yeah. the render like yeah i don't use the render wholesale i use it as a as a lay-in that's but cool. I, yeah I, I use 3d more and more now yeah awesome can you go a little bit into your philosophy on it partially because there's so many people that have that come from the opposite spectrum there's some people that say 3d is cheating and they oh. will never use it or there's some people that will try to rush into it and won't learn the fundamentals I definitely think the first one is misplaced and the second one is also misplaced. Uh, you have, you should learn the fundamentals. Like I think 3d can be, I wouldn't say cheating, but I would say a crutch. If you cannot draw your own perspective, then okay. it's no good. Uh, it'll be of limited use. I should say, I mean, you could do it, but if you don't know how to draw perspective, even the 3d won't help you very much because you'll still be rigidly aligned to the, but the problem with computers is they're they're technically very perfect. Yeah. So if you render out, yeah, if you render out a perspective on a computer, it's probably not going to achieve your design goals because it's it's very it's probably going to be very rigid unless you're a very good modeler. In which case, 
you probably should be in 3D modeling and not painting. Yeah. But, uh, so when I render out a scene in 3D, like I, I still apply my own internal warping to it and my own logic to it. It's just to get me a, a space to, to play in. But um, yeah, I spent years and years. I, I, haven't, I didn't touch 3D from the first 15 years of my drawing career, let's say. I, yeah. I know I started in 3D, but once I started drawing, I completely abandoned 3D. And I learned all the all the basic skills that an artist should have, like uh, perspective and uh, things like anatomy and form and light and shadow and all that stuff in, in 2D. And then now the 3D just just fits right in. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just slots right in. Uh, yeah. And and timeline wise, uh, just because, again, I'm always encountering students uh, and I feel like they have this sort of really n maybe just a shortened idea of how long this process takes. Like how long did it take you to, I don't know, to reach a level where you thought, okay, I'm suitable to work with clients or I'm, I'm suitable to, to work professionally. Probably. Um, I would, so I started uh, drawing seriously in 2001 and I feel like I didn't find a level of, confidence until 2006 let's say because okay. i was like i was in midway through my first job and i was like okay i think i know a few things that can be replicated to successful degrees yeah uh, like like theories in my head that were becoming concrete it's like okay i can see how light and shadow works not that i had it mastered but i'm like this happens in real life and that took me about five years to like clue into to a degree that i could replicate it in my paintings yeah um so that was about five, but but that was still an early stage for me. Um, I feel like if I go back to look at my own work, um, it's not until roughly 2010 where I'm like, oh, that's a painting that I could still look at and not be disgusted by. Okay. Uh, like I, I feel like it took me about nine years before I'm like, oh, there's a voice there. Like if there's yeah. something there that is, that is me, uh, that's actually me. Because the thing is, my own theory is, we touched on this earlier, but... The, your personality is always a part of you, obviously. And your art, like the goal that you have as an artist is to get your skills to the level where your personality can just come out. Yeah, uh, because, yeah. Yeah, like that's the hard part. Everyone um, has their own personality and therefore their own little bias and little thing that they want to do with their art just subconsciously. And it, it takes years to get your skills to the level where that can just mesh uh, with your personality yeah. and then and then that's where the voice happens exactly so for me yeah so for me uh 2009 2010 is uh, the first time i think that started actually happening for me awesome yeah i always tell students 10 years and they get really angry yeah, yeah. for, for me years nine nine years yeah for me I, i'm i just look at my art i'm like that's ah, terrible whatever who cares <laughs> and i'm like just give it another six or seven years and that'll be good and yeah. that's just that's just the mindset i think you have to be in it's just develop you should just want to do art to just make it, well, not necessarily make it better, but just get, I don't know. I guess it's hard because there's financial pressure. Uh, that's the problem. Yeah. That's, because that's, as a teacher, I'm sure you let me know on your end, James, if you get this, but uh, so many times um, students want jobs. Yeah. And, and that's totally natural. Like, I, 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 that's fine. That's great. But the, it, the two don't coexist very well. Um, usually the art, like if you want to be an artist who has, you know, your own voice, that's going to take 10 years. Yeah. If definitely. you want a job you can get a job in, in, in three years, maybe, or two, like you, I've seen people get jobs in two or three years, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're even that good. Like you can get a job doing, uh, you know, color fill background paintings at a studio without much, uh, work. Like yeah. you can still have to put work in it, but if, there's a difference between working at a studio and being a cog in the wheel, which is great. It's a paycheck. It's great. But there's a difference between that and actually being an artist who can, who can put something out that is truly representative of them, yeah. uh, who they are. Uh, and I think the, the, the challenge, and I don't know how to manage it really. I just try my best in my own life, but the goal, like you want, I want both. I want to have a job at a studio, but I also want to have art that represents who I am. So a lot of the times, uh, I don't know. I'm getting lost in my own head now, but I kind of have to separate the two. Like sometimes when I work for a client, I have to actively turn off the part of my brain that wants the painting to be emblematic of me. And I'm like, okay, let's just fulfill the client's needs today. Yeah. And, and tomorrow let's do my own work. 
Um, sometimes the best jobs, uh, the best jobs combine them. And every now and then that job comes around. Like uh, I got to do some work for uh, the Nutcracker last year. For I Disney. saw. And that, like, that was the best project I ever worked on because they really wanted me to do the thing that I do, which I don't even know what that is, but I make a mess, right? Yeah. They, want, they wanted me, I think my art director even said, like, make an effing mess. And that, awesome. when he said that, I'm like, you're the man. Uh, <laughs> I, I like working for you. That's and, great. Um, yeah, and that project, it was fun every step of the way, but not all projects are like that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I've, I've looked at all the paintings. You can see that your personality comes out in them. And I think why that is, is like we said, you spent the time to develop your voice and develop the, the skill to be able to translate exactly the way you feel and put that on the canvas. Um, yeah. Do you find that... I'm still oh, trying. Yeah, and it, it never really ends. It's always... a Even with music, I've yeah. been doing it for so long, and I feel like I pick it up and I'm like, no, nope, still got to get, you know, change this or got to, you're always tweaking, pulling strings and, and modifying it. Yeah. And like, what is it that when you're doing your own music, like, what is it that makes you want to modify something? Like, I don't know. I, I, at this point, yeah, yeah. I've heard so many things I've done. And I'm just like, right. I'm tired of hearing that. <laughs> right. It's like intangible, I think. Yeah. It's so strange. Yeah. Uh, you just look at, you listen to something or you look at something and you're like, that just doesn't feel right. Like, even though the perspective in the drawing, the perspective can be right. The color can be right. But you're like, there's just something that doesn't sit well. And like, yeah. that's an intangible, like that is, there is that is. intangible. Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah, yeah. If, you know, and you see this all the time, uh, especially in the guitar community, there are so many people that are incredibly technically proficient and I don't know why guitar specifically, people are just so good at playing them, but there are just so many people that are technically, technically proficient, but don't really write great music. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I play, like I said, I play a bit of music too. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. But it, for some reason in guitar, it's <laughs> so prominent. Like everybody can just play super fast. They can play all their scales. They know all the, the <laughs> like circle. The finger of tapping yeah. solos. <laughs> Everything. Yeah, but nobody yeah. ever focuses on the songwriting aspect of it. And and for me, the, the big lesson has been trying to turn all of that down in my head, you know, turn that, that need to be technically proficient down and say, Hey, maybe I don't need to go so crazy this time. Yeah. I mean, there's a, I can't remember. This is some old cliche saying where it's like you learn you, the reason you learn the rules is so you can break them. Yeah. And, and like, that's it. Like if you don't know perspective for instance, I keep coming back to perspective, but if you don't, if you don't, well, let's say anatomy, that's a better example. If you don't know anatomy, you won't be able to design anatomy Yeah, because you'll, definitely. you'll get things wrong. And the things that there are certain things you just can't get wrong. Like, uh, and, and still have your design look cohesive. Yeah. And if you are trying to draw a humanoid figure and you don't know anatomy, you're going to get things wrong that will just scream to everyone, I don't know what I'm doing. But yeah. if you if you know anatomy and you know it so well, you can just put it in the back of your brain. And then when you draw, you can invent different and shapes simpli and, different and simplify it and simplify it yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah, you can, exactly. You, you can learn what doesn't need to be there. That's yeah, exactly it. Exactly. And I see this with um, someone like Claire Wendling where... She's, oh man, she's amazing. Yeah, it's my favorite, and she'll yeah. she'll just it'll be all this complexity of of musculature and tendons and how they interlock, but she does it in just two lines. Yeah, dude, you can't see this, but my iPad that I'm talking to on right now is sitting on a Claire Wendling book. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, like there we I, go. I was looking at Claire Wendling's book yesterday. Yeah, and yeah. I think maybe the only equivalent I can think of like the shreddy guitar guy is just Kim Jong Gi yeah. making these insane. Oh, yeah. just, that's the only thing I could yeah. think of as being the equivalent of like the, the guy in the, the, I don't know, the guitar store just playing super fast. Yeah. But the thing like, I, I, you know, like I love Kim Jong Gi as well, but like the thing with him is for, for he is in the fortunate situation where the technical stuff matches his personality. Like he, yeah. his art, like when you look at his art, it, yeah, it's technical, but it still feels like there's something in him that's coming yeah. out. Yeah, I was like going to some intangible thing. I was going to say it's still somehow more tasteful, and I don't know. Maybe it's because yeah. sounds are can be really abrasive if they're annoying. Whereas yeah. if you just look at something like that, you know, even if it's a little bit blur, especially you know at a, at a distance, some of those really technical pieces are kind of hard to look at. But you're not if you're not offended by the sound or offended <laughs> by the vision. I know what you mean. Like yeah. it can actually hurt your, like sound can hurt your ears. Yeah. And I think I've yeah. noticed this too, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I've noticed that with music, people, 
the response of the audience can I, is much more polarizing than with art. So with music, people get really angry or they get really excited. Whereas with art, oh. they can just look at it and go, oh, that's awesome. Right. Maybe because art just like you look at it so quick, like it's like instant. You, yeah. You've seen it. Whereas music, you got to sit there and listen to it. That's what I was I was thinking. I was developing this idea like maybe it's the amount of investment on the on behalf of the audience, right? Because you can't yeah. really gauge a song. Well, you guess you can within maybe 10 seconds or so, but that's still a much greater time of investment than the millisecond that it takes to, you know, inspect a piece of artwork, at least on Instagram or something like that. Yeah, like art... I guess, yeah, I agree. Yeah, art's kind of interesting. We're like on Instagram, we're kind of trained to see things in thumbnail now Yeah. Uh, because of social media, which which I think for the artist is actually a good thing because a lot of the time I uh, test my artwork in thumbnail. Like I'll zoom yeah. out or whatever. Like I'll look at my artwork in thumbnail a lot because if it doesn't work in thumbnail, it doesn't matter how it looks big for, yep. for me. It's got to read in thumbnail. So I don't know what the equivalent in music is. Like music is... I mean, it's so related, but there are certain things that are different. Yeah, like yeah. fundamentally different. Yeah, and uh, the thumbnail thing is something I learned the hard way when I realized, it's like, oh, that does not translate <laughs> does not translate well at all. Yeah. Oh, it, totally. And it always has to do with composition, like mm -hmm. the way the way your shapes are connecting and the way your values are simplified. Yeah. I think I, I think at the root of it, people enjoy simplicity because yeah. it's so easy to take in. Um, but the thing with simplicity, it, it can be nuanced, like simplicity can still be nuanced, but it can be uh, like a shape can be so simple. I mean, I have a YouTube video called Good Shapes. Yep. And like I, I break down paintings like the bottom of this guy's hat is just a little square shape. And that's so simple. It's like the mo it's so irreducibly simple that when you look at that painting, it's just like you get it because everyone can read that square. Whereas if the shape is like this little shape. It takes forever to read that shape. And if your yeah. painting is full of shapes like that, it's not doing you any favors. So I've learned to uh, read my work in thumbnail and like those shapes, a good shape should read equally well in thumbnail. Awesome. And about shapes, because I feel like it's such an abstract thing. Uh, how do you develop that skill to, to start seeing things in shape more? Or how do you develop that ability to to create better shapes? I'm sure it's from studying the masters and that sort of thing, but yeah uh for me it was well yes like you said studying the masters is, is really good i think studying from life i always say to my students like uh, study from life because everyone um uh, the digital age everyone is studying from photographs and yeah. like, that's great you should you should do that um but if you only do that it's difficult to train your eye to the degree that it that you can if you also added traditional study there's yeah. just something about there's just something about the way a camera experiences reality versus the way uh, you do, because when you know when you're looking at something with your eyes in real life, uh, you're only focusing on the thing that you're looking at, and you can't like if I'm looking, I'm looking at my speaker over here, and I can see the little shapes in my speaker. I can't necessarily see the shapes over here because it's yeah. periphery, right? So, so but a camera, if I took a snapshot, the camera would see all of this equally. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So when you study from a photo, you're actually not seeing the world in the way that you actually see the world. Uh, so I always find that studying from life can connect your work with, I don't know what it is, but if there's a simplicity you'll reach, uh, I, I think, to a greater degree. Now, I, I'm not saying that's a rule. There's no rules in art. So uh, if, if I'm sure there's really good artists out there who only do photo stuff, uh, and that's fine. But for me, I've always found... Uh, for me, and it's also true of my favorite artists, they're also very good from life. Um, they're able to find that balance and achieve some kind of simplicity that, I don't know, comes from painting from life. It's hard to explain how, but. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I want to ask about the genesis of the YouTube channel. What, because you were working before that, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yep, I had a studio job for about seven years, various studios, okay. and I made my first YouTube video in 2009, yeah. What inspired, I, well, not only making the YouTube channel, but what inspired, I noticed that you started committing a lot more time last year. Yeah, yeah. What was, what was the reason behind that decision? I just noticed that uh, I really enjoyed teaching, and I felt like I had an also a... A desire to like I also love video production as we got, yeah. kind of got into so I felt I felt the growing need to combine those two loves and YouTube was the obvious outlet for that um, so I committed myself to 
do one video a month, I think, yeah, about a year and a half ago. And I've pretty much been on track. I think I've missed two or three months somewhere along there, but, um, we've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. I used to like, I used, if you go before 2000, like 17 or somewhere, I would miss years. Like there was once I didn't do a video for like two years. Uh, that those days are gone. I, I, I love it too much now. And I'm constantly coming up with ideas. And because, you know, when you post videos, your following grows and you have tons of people who I feel like are counting on me to make a video now. So I feel like I, I owe the audience who are kind enough to subscribe to me and watch my stuff. I feel like I owe them some good production. So yeah, that's a weird thing. Yeah. Oh no, I was gonna say that's a weird thing that develops too, is this sort of obligation towards this abstract audience that you've never met most of them. Yeah. It's so strange, man. Let me know if you can relate to this, but like I'll be working on a, on a video and it's just me. Like it's just me in, in this room. This is my studio here. And it's just me making a video. And I know like once I hit that publish button, like thousands of people are going to see this. And it's crazy from just me, one person to a lot of people. Yeah. And I, it's hard to, uh, it's just a weird feeling. Like it I, is sometimes, strange. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Let, do you feel that? Like, well, to quote myself from uh, about an hour before we started doing this, yeah. I accidentally clicked stream and <laughs> and then quickly said oh fuck oh shit oh no <laughs> stop streaming and then that got seen it was a second long video and it got seen 200 times so that's it's very hey, that's weird nice <laughs> but it's it's scary sometimes because i'm always afraid that i'm like i'm leaving the streaming software or that it's just surreal to be interacting with this many people it's stressful it's overwhelming sometimes see if some hacker is out there they would do some hack where they can make your computer broadcast without you even knowing. <laughs> I know. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'm sure they can, and I don't want to invite them to do that. Please don't do that, everybody. <laughs> no, don't do that, everyone. Don't, yeah. don't, definitely don't broadcast James's computer. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, somebody already saw it. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, every now and then, well, no, every single video, someone will comment like, oh, you're saying this word wrong, or you forgot about this. And I'm like, oh. like I'm gonna. For, I'm just. Yeah. I'm just one person, so I'm gonna forget these things. And like sometimes I'm like, should I start getting like a, a beta or what do you call it, like a test audience? Yeah, maybe uh, to watch these because sometimes, uh, like I'm, res- I'm totally receptive to that kind of feedback. Like uh, some guy yesterday told me I'm saying the word gouache weird, and I'm like, he's right. Damn it, he's right. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish someone could catch me on that before I published it. Yeah. But I'm too. I'm too lazy to go hire a, a test audience. You know. Uh, but maybe one day, like if, if the following keeps growing, I, I might try and do that. It's because... strange. Uh, I, I went to Proco studio to do his, to do an interview for the podcast with him and he's oh, nice. got editors. He's got the whole team. I mean, yeah. us schleps over here, just one person doing the whole thing. Yeah. So like, how do you edit your stuff? Is it just you in a room? It's just me. I'm, I, I'm considering hiring an editor. I've talked to a few people recently, but yeah, it's mostly just been me. I'm sure I make a ton of, actually, I know for a fact I make a ton of mistakes and I know I always spell things incorrectly and then publish the video with things spelled incorrectly. And of oh, course, that's the worst. That's the worst. Yeah. That's like, that's like just fishing for comments. Yeah. If you spell something wrong. If you say something wrong, spell something wrong. It's so or, bad. God forbid you say something that's not factually correct. You are, you're done. Oh yeah. You're without a doubt. Comments. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I turn those into jokes. Like uh, on a recent episode of one of my things, I talked about how everyone says I sound like some guy. Or oh, yeah, yeah. Says, uh, I went down the rabbit th- hole, oh. that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that guy, yeah, Yang, yeah, yeah. And um, the other one was um, that I mispronounced uh, the book fish. Like I got that all the time. So I, I just turned it into jokes. Like for me, it's like a, a funny thing. But it's funny how a lot of people clue into the same stuff. Yeah. For me, I um, have this tendency of, uh, like I said, misspelling. But of course, my biggest video has a misspelling right in the title, which not on the title on the YouTube page, which I can edit, but Uh, in a title screen that shows up. And you can't edit that. I spelled the word increase without the N. And. uh, Increase. Increase, yeah. And you. Have plenty which of is, yeah, which is like it increasing <laughs> it is a lot like it but i <laughs> i got uh so many comments about that it was it was sad yeah you know yeah people love uh hunting for stuff like that mm-hmm. i use that kind of psychology in one of my uh, my recent video i put an easter egg in the video oh yeah and uh and i did that because i well it was i love easter egg stuff too but i know that people love searching for things so i'm like let's turn this search into like a positive thing and let's, let's put something in the video on purpose that's hidden and yeah. they can find. 
instead of it being like a spelling mistake, let's put something, <laughs> let's direct this psychology in a way that's going to make it fun for everyone. And that way you're not sad afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to turn, uh, I don't, I try not to, I turn comments off my phone because I'll be like, uh, you know, someone will come up with a critique. I'm like, Ugh. And like yeah. I just, it, it brings the day down a little bit. It's like, God damn it. And yeah. it's the worst when they're right. That's the worst. Part. I know. <laughs> Sometimes it's good though. Sometimes it's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. Yeah. I've, I've corrected my pronunciations of things. I've corrected uh, certain ways that I do things like yeah. certain types of patterns of speech that I have that people have pointed out. I've, I've actually made that correction because of comments like that. So I try and take it in a good way. Yeah, exactly. I think the, um, the feeling of it is so bad when you're like, Oh no, they're right. And then, it hurts a little bit, stings, but then it, yeah, it yeah, steers yeah. you. You don't in, want to admit they're right. Yeah. yeah, it steers you in the right direction, though, I, I think, in general. Oh, not always, but sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, I feel like we're getting on some kind of crazy tangent. So uh, what's, um, like, uh, you're a teacher. Like, what do you enjoy more? Like, do you, teaching or working on music or working on production? Like, oh, what? I never know. It changes from time to time. I don't. I don't think teaching is where I want to be long term. I think... Yeah. Because I personally just started as a means of studying. Uh, yeah. And from doing music, I knew that it was going to take a really, really long time. And I said, mm -hmm. well, it's probably going to take at least 10 years before I started making any money, which I pleasantly was surprised that I managed to get a job teaching and doing that before 10 years. Uh, so for me, I don't know what my long-term goal would be, but I would, I would like to combine that with music and film production uh to, for me, like the, the penultimate goal or the ultimate goal might be like an animated film where I wrote the score or something like that. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. So you, you put out music like uh, like actively? Uh, I'm not as much anymore. I was in a band professionally for five to seven years. I don't remember exactly how long. Right. Um, and Playing, play, What do you play? Like what did you play in that band? I played guitar, wrote a lot of music. I played... Uh, it was death metal and oh 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 you told me this yeah sorry i know this that's yeah. awesome yeah death, yeah that's great and it was a lot of fun and i did that for so many years and I, you know the, one of the things that i do miss about music in as opposed to art is you had this experience where you would connect with the audience directly and you would play a show mm -hmm. and you were right there in front of it and you could feel that energy uh right and i'm, I'm not sure if i'm working up to something like that or if um or if I am trying to find some way, I feel like the live streams are great because I get that sort of back and forth. Yeah, I, exactly. I find like teaching live stream, like part of my CGMA teaching is we do a a, a, we, a live chat once a week. And yeah. I find for me, the live chats are the best thing. Also like on my Patreon, I do for a certain tier level, I do uh, Q and A's like once a quarter. And like those are just fun. Like you're just connecting with people and just having a chat and yeah. talking arts in this case it's that connection that that i love the most and i love teaching classes in person too i try and do that whenever i can i'm not employed by a physical school right now but i try and do workshops like on location just a little impromptu little workshop and Definitely. i love just it just yeah but you get you get that connection that i would imagine you also get with music to a live audience yeah definitely maybe a fewer broken noses and people getting <laughs> beat up but <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, you, if you played a jazz concert, you probably would. Oh yeah. Fewer broken noses. <laughs> far fewer, far fewer. Um, I actually, I this is completely random, but I just went to one of my favorite bands recently, and it was, it's it's so cool to watch that. But it, music is just such a grueling experience of you know traveling around and doing that. Mm -hmm. I, the one thing I love about art is that. Oh, I, I another thing that I love about it, aside from the fact that, you, well, it just. I, th I like that you can draw inspiration from nearly anything, whereas music, I, I feel like it can be very self-referential where you're inspired by older bands or you're inspired by people that have written before you. And mm -hmm. with art, you can just walk outside and then literally anything in your vision is inspiration for whatever you're going to be making. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess because art is visual and the world is visual. Yeah. Uh, you can you can link the two a little bit closer yeah. yeah i'm sure there's some people that can go out and listen to the sounds of the ocean but i'm i'm too literal i'm not very metaphorical i'm like i i can't draw inspiration from that i don't understand yeah no i, I know what you mean i know what you mean like so many i do that with painting sometimes where i'll like i'll be sitting on a, at a park or something and i'm like there's 
there's a painting here, but it's not a painting of the thing I'm seeing. It's like, I want to paint what I feel right now. Yeah. And, and like, it's like, how do you do that? Well, that's where, I mean, that's where that whole thing about your personality and skill has to come out. But there's so many times where it's like, I wish I could capture in a painting, whatever this feeling is. Yeah. And that's a, that's a maddening kind of problem to try and solve. But a lot of my paintings come from that place and uh, they're not all successful, but. Do you feel as though you it. have successfully solved it at certain points? Yeah, yeah, time, uh, yeah, uh, sometimes. Uh, it's a it's a hit and miss thing. Sometimes I'll fail at it and then I'll just put, you know, I'll save the painting and go away and then come back the next day and figure it out. Or other times I'll figure it out right away. Or other times it'll be so far away that I'm like, that's a failure. Let's just yeah. delete that file. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it depends. Do you find that's that, where you, oh, do you sorry. find that as you've gotten, you know, just as you've progressed that you've become maybe less critical of your work or because I think early on it's really easy to look at your work and really beat yourself up over it. Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm not critical of my work. Like I, if I do a painting that fails or do a painting that succeeds, like I feel the same and it, it doesn't okay. matter to me anymore. Like I've just developed, you know, it wasn't always like that. I always yeah. wanted to succeed in a painting, but now it's just like, I feel like they're both equally informative of the next piece that happens. Uh, if I do a failure, it, it bugs me a little bit. I'm like, why? But I, I just go into analysis mode. I'm like, okay, why did that fail? Well, yeah. let's go down the list. Is it my shapes, my composition, my edges, my color, like what, or a combination? What is it? And then the more experience you get, the, the better troubleshooter you are. So yep. I'll look at a painting that didn't work. I'm like, oh, it's A, B, and C, and a little bit of uh, G. And, I'll, and then next time I'll fix it. Or if it can be fixed in that painting, I'll just do it the next day. But I don't, uh, if I do a failure, I don't care. The only time if I, that I care is if I'm working for a client, the pressure's kind of on. You yeah, can't yeah. Really, can't really fail past a certain degree for a client. Like then they'll get upset. One thing, yeah, like revisions are okay. But uh, if you're not doing the thing right, then that's not exactly good. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I want to know, what is your long-term plan? Or what is your, what do you want to do if you had unlimited time what would be your main goal in art or do you feel like uh, you're already doing it that's an interesting way to ask the question because at first i was going to say i do i look like a guy with a long-term plan <laughs> <laughs> i got ninja turtles on my shelf yeah um uh but your, your second phrasing i think is is interesting if i had unlimited time yeah what would i if i had unlimited time i would increase my skills in all of my interests oh shit which, which would include uh, everything from like uh, painting to drawing to 3D modeling to visual effects to animation to uh, all this stuff, uh, music even. Like I would increase all my skills with unlimited time, and I would find I would do the thing you said, where I would find the perfect project that just brings them all together. <laughs> I think which, unlimited time might be too big with, of a time scale. <laughs> yeah, with unlimited time. Oh, you wanted a realistic answer. Yes, I did want a realistic answer. Oh. Well, then why did you say unlimited time? I shouldn't have used unlimited time. That was a terrible <laughs> phrasing. I'm very sorry. Okay. If I had if I had limited time, um, well, I guess it would be, I guess it would just be that, but under uh, under the limitations of, of time, like I still want to uh, learn these new skills and yeah. figure out ways to combine them. And I, and I feel like um, I'm... I'm doing that, and that's what keeps me kind of fulfilled personally on my YouTube channel, for example, uh, my 10 Minutes to Better Painting series. Episode 8 was the very first time that I combined 3D with 2D animation. There's, I have my intern character, who is just me, by the way. People get mad that I have an uh, unpaid intern. That's me <laughs> as an unpaid intern. Oh, okay. Uh, it's inspired by me. Anyway, in that video, I have my intern character who's animated in 2D, interacting with a 3D uh, wheel of fortune kind of wheel. That yeah. was my first uh, thing. And the, the impetus behind that was like, let's take all my various interests and find a way to combine them into an art lesson. So like I'm trying to do what I said I would do if I had unlimited time, but of course I, you know, I'm limited by so many other things, so I can only do so much, but that's what, and you know, the next video I make, I'm working on another kind of visual effects shot that combines, in this case, it's going to combine like 3D camera tracking with 3D animation, uh, with After Effects, like I, I'm trying to into an art lesson. I'm trying. That's to so cool. I don't mean to insult the other art YouTubers because I love them all, but I think your videos are definitely my favorite. They're they're so awesome oh, the way that you incorporate uh, thanks, everything. Uh, that's humbling to hear. I I appreciate it. Uh, I, I don't know. I just uh, I just try and combine things that I like, and I'm pretty specific over like you, you talked about with teaching. 
you you use like analogies and names for things and and I try and just increase the clarity by which I understand something and I'm ruthless in my own videos like with their editing like I'll re-record yeah. things and re-record things and it's not it's n the farthest thing from live it's the farthest thing from live my videos are all they're super edited and uh, I just find a lot of joy and clarity like I really value someone who can communicate clearly be it in speech or in writing or in, in art and I just try my best to reach an impossible standard that, that I have. Um, so, you know, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Marco, I want to thank you so much. I hate to end it kind of early, but it's super late here and uh, I have people waiting and it is unfortunately the Stanley cup playoffs. So Un not unfortunately, unfor not, un not unfortunately, not unfortunately. Well, unfortunately for me, because the Rangers aren't in it. Uh, and I think the Maple Leafs are, I think they play tonight. I'm, I'm rooting for them. Nice. Okay, and, you and me both, man. Yeah. So, uh, that, J James, thanks so much for having me. This is uh, it's always a blast to talk to you, and I can't believe so much time has gone by. But uh, hey, if you're ever in Toronto, let me know. If I'm ever in New York, I'll let you know. I will gladly come to Toronto. There actually might be plans to come to Toronto relatively soon, so I will let you know. Yeah, let me know. We'll go out and sketch something. Yeah, and maybe we'll make a, a YouTube video or something with it. Hey, that'd be cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Anytime. All thanks right. for watching, everyone.